Uh, if you are a note taker, you will love today. Today is a fairly, a fairly academic day. Uh, so those of you that are like that, then you'll like this. Those of you that aren't, then prepare to endure. Because that's just where we are. This is one of those types of days. We're going to really look at the fruit of the Spirit and kind of dig into it today. We talked last week. When looking at this, we, 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 we backed up before it and looked at the works of the flesh. We have the fruit of the Spirit we're looking at today. We looked at the works of the flesh last week and how, how all of those works are outworkings of our sinful nature, our human sinful nature, and that um, they, like all sin, they promise everything and deliver nothing. That's what the world does. That's what the, the flesh does. That's what sin does. It promises everything and delivers nothing but more heartache and more emptiness and more hurt and more pain. That's what the works of the flesh do. The fruit of the Spirit is the opposite of that. And we're going to dig into that today uh, together. So Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Lord God, please speak through me and to me today as we dig into your word. Lord, do the work that only you can do, that only your spirit can do. May we be obedient and faithful. May we hear your word. May we hear and hear your word this morning, God. May we hear it and take it inside, take it deep into the core of who we are so that the outworking of that word would be these fruit in our lives, God. This fruit in our lives. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the fruit of the spirit. Right, the fruit of the Spirit, yielding to the presence and work of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of Christ in our lives. This is what should be produced. This is the characteristic list. It's not the only list in the New Testament like this. And it's not an exhaustive list, but it is a pretty good list of what it should look like to be a follower of Jesus. And we start there at the beginning of that verse where it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. We know but is talking in opposite to the works of the flesh. We had that choice. As a follower of Jesus, you have a choice to allow your old sinful nature to reign and rule and destroy in your life or to yield to the Spirit and allow the fruit of the Spirit to be produced in your life. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have this choice. You don't have this choice. You are ruled and reigned and dominated by your sinful nature and there is no way you will grit your teeth and, and legalize your way to getting past that. You can't do it. You won't do it. Man has tried since the beginning of time and, and, and it's not going to happen. We have to have the grace of God in order for this to happen. So notice here that first is the but, the choice, and then the fruit of the Spirit. It's a, it's a cool word. That, that word is used often in Scripture. You know, the, the fruit is, is, an, is a, an expression of our descendants, right? Our children are fruits of ours. There's many ways that fruit is used, but this is probably my favorite way that it's used in the Scripture, this, this particular area, this, this place. Because fruit is produced. It is not manufactured. You cannot manufacture fruit. You can't do it. You, you, you can't get this and get that and get this and get that and put together an apple. You can't do it. You either have what it takes for an apple to, to form or you don't. You have to have the seed for it to become the fruit. And even in having the seed, all you can do is protect the seed and, and, and help the seed and fertilize the seed and water the seed and take the weeds away from the seed so that the seed becomes what it's going to become. But you don't actually make the fruit. The fruit is not manufactured. It is, it is produced from something that is of itself and not of our doing. See, machines, they manufacture items in a factory, right? But they don't produce them. They only, it's only assembled. The parts are assembled into something else. We don't produce the fruit of the Spirit. We can't consistently produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit in us produces this, these fruit. It produces them when we faithful, faithfully seek a life honoring Jesus. A believer in life-giving union with Christ will see the fruit of the Spirit be produced in his life. But the, a believer cannot manufacture this fruit. And a non-believer can't either. There's no, there, there's, no, there's no way that that happens. Jesus says it like this in John. This is, this is Jesus actually talking in John. He says, I am the vine. 
I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. Notice there again, you're already clean. You've already received salvation. Now are you going to do what a person that has been saved should do? Remain in me, and I in you. Just as, the, as, a, as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Uh, if you have an apple tree and you cut off that branch from the tree, it won't continue to produce apples. It will die because it is separated from the trunk of the tree. So it, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. This is the desire, much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch, and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. God desires that we allow the Spirit to produce fruit fruit and more spiritual fruit in our lives in our lives and then multiplied in those who we disciple that's God's desire so as we dig into each one of these for a minute this morning understand that's where it's coming from that's the desire of God that is that is God's hope is that we do this and the first one is love gets mentioned all the time we sing about it all the time we talk about it all the time it's the foundation of everything God's love right in the greek it's agape in hebrew you really have to combine two hebrew words to get this this complete understanding of of god's love there's more than these two words but these two words do a great job the the hesed and the ahaba you combine those two words and you get a good understanding of what agape is a good understanding of what god's divine love is it's a it's a all-encompassing word it's an action word it's not a feeling but it is a feeling but it's not only a feeling and it's also an action it's god's love that it's it could say it like this this is where a place in scripture where these two words are used together this is jeremiah 31 3 says the lord appeared to him from far away i have loved you speaking to israel with an everlasting love therefore i have continued to extend faithful love to you jeremiah 31 Three, or if you put the Hebrew word in there, in that, in that with the English, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have ahava you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend hesed to you. Ah- ahava is more of the, of the overarching feeling of caring for something and wanting to see good done for something. And then hesed, we, a year or so ago, we did an entire message on just that word. It is God's uh, loving kindness. It is, his, it is his love in action. You combine those two things, you get what it is to love. Or you could say it like this, like John says it, 1 John 4, 8. The one who does not love does not know God. That's how foundational it is. That's how foundational it is. You don't love, then you don't understand. You don't get it. You don't know him because he is love, because God is love. Not God is loving. God is love. It is who he is. God's love was revealed among us in this way. What is God's love like? God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this. I love this definition of God's love right here. Verse 10. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. That's God's love. Love in action taking away what is deserved, giving what is undeserved, drawing us to him, doing everything it takes through his love, through his kindness, through his faithfulness, to reach out and to cry out and to, and to try to get us to just turn to him and come to him because he knows that is what is best for us. That is where we actually find the fulfillment that sin promises but never delivers. This is love, John tells us here in 1 John. This is love. And the rest of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit are further descriptions of this love. Further descriptions of God's chesed and the hava. That's what these other things are. It's all, a, it's all more words to describe this one concept. It's the foundation. Love is the foundation. And the next thing is joy. 
Joy. Anybody not want joy in their life? You know, I've never heard someone walk around and say, you know, I could just use a little less joy. I, I just, just wish I had a little less joy in my life. It's really getting on my nerves, you know. Sometimes, we, sometimes people's happiness gets on our nerves. But I've never seen someone express true joy and it not be something that someone else enjoyed themselves. Joy is, it's different. It's different. The word here is hara in Greek. Hara. It's a deep and abiding inner rejoicing, which was promised to all those who abide in Christ. This joy is promised to us and given at the moment of salvation. Whether or not we yield to the Spirit and allow it to bear fruit in our life is our choice, but it is given at salvation. John 15, 11 says, I have spoken these things to you so that my joy, Jesus' joy, God the Father's joy, may be in you and your joy may be made complete. May be complete. He gives us joy. He wants us to have Joy, 2 Corinthians 6.10, as grieving yet always rejoicing. You, you hear that? As grieving yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Paul's talking to the Corinthians in this case. It is not, this, this joy that God gives us does not depend on circumstances because it rests in God's sovereign control. Catch what is saying right there. Okay. You can be sad and still have joy. The circumstance causes sadness. You can be mourning and grieving and still have joy. The circumstances causes us to grieve. The circumstance causes us to mourn. But ultimately, someone who has yielded to the Spirit and has the Holy Spirit living inside of them and growing their faith and ripening the fruit of the Spirit will look at any circumstance and understand that God knows what He's doing. He is in sovereign control and that anything that we are experiencing now is temporary, but everything we experience now has eternal rewards when lived out in faith for Jesus. That's how you can have a joy through any experience. Or, or as I've told Tony this many times. We did a, a, youth, a youth study several years ago, good to great. And one of the things that we were challenged to do in there that I'm fixing to start back because I've been convicted about it lately was to write down verses on an index card, keep them in our pocket, and just read them all day. Every time someone's had, just pull them out and read them. And one of the verses that I put on that card, and oh, how I did not know that I would need this as much as I have needed this verse, is Romans 8, 28. And it is talking about the same thing. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. You can have joy no matter the circumstance in this life. You'll, <laughs> it's a weird thing to be sad and joyful at the same time. It's a strange thing to be mournful and grieving and joyful at the same time. But that is life as a follower of Jesus, a joy a joy, a joy that we all desire to have. The third thing is peace. Now, some people break these down into three triads. That's a little too academic even for me. I mean, I, mean, I, think, they're, I think they're trying too hard when they do that. Now, there's really smart people that, that have said that and do that, and, and I get what they're saying, but to me, it's love and the other eight describing what love is. You can break it down into triads if you want, but again, I don't know. Too, much, too far for me. But the third one is peace. Arane, peace, right? Love and joy together produce peace. Now there is, there is a, I think, a, a purpose to Paul's order in this fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy together produce peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. How much peace does Jesus have? Well, he is at one with the Father. There is no more, there's no more peace you can have than to be at one with Father God. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives to you. How does the world give? <laughs> Always expecting something in return. Always expecting something in return. Your heart must not be troubled or fearful. I give you. It's, it's a piece of, of inner God-given strength. Even in the face of adverse or sometimes unimaginable Circumstances. There is a peace there. There's a peace there. It's unexplainable. And Paul tells us that. 
in Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought or surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thayer's definition is this, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. That's peace. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. That's a peace. That's true peace. Peace made with God, therefore peace in all circumstances. And then he goes to patience. Exactly, right? This, I think we like, I think we think there's eight descriptions of the fruit of the Spirit. I think we just like skip this one over. It's like patience. Miss me with that, bro. I'm a little better with compulsion. I'm a little better with reaction, right? There's a, there's a famous quote that, that you've probably said. I've said it a hundred times in my life probably. It originally comes from, a, from a, a poem in 1360 by a poet named William Langland that says, patience is a virtue, right? Patience is a virtue. It's a, it's a phrase coming from his poem. But it's been updated recently in a, in a, in a new book by Father Jonathan Morris. And, and the new one says this, in the, in the way of serenity and finding peace and happiness in the serenity prayer, it's a book that he wrote, patience is a virtue, possess it if you can, Seldom found in a woman, never found in a man. <laughs> now, now that's an accurate quote, right? Patience, patience, <laughs> patience. Mac, macrothomia, macrothomia is the Greek word here used for patience. The, the, honestly, the King James, the King James has this translated very well. Long suffering. It's a great translation in this case. Long suffering. Because sometimes patience, we think of it as like an, a, a, a willingness just to, just to not do something, right? But it's, it's more than that. It's not, it's not just willingness to wait, as patience can be understood sometimes. It's not just waiting, but it's a willingness to endure others. That last word is the key part, right? It's, it's long-tempered instead of short-tempered. Long-tempered instead of short-tempered. It's, it's a willingness to endure. It's a willingness to put up with each other because others have to put up with you. Colossians 1, 11, May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience. Same word, macrothomia, patience, with joy. See how it all works together? See, here's the difference between natural patience and, and fruit of the Spirit Spirit patience. This patience, macrothomia, does not consider retaliation, even when having been wronged by another. Did you hear that? Not that it doesn't retaliate. This kind of patience doesn't consider retaliation when being wronged by another. Justice, maybe. Retaliation, never. Fruit of the Spirit patience, macrothomia patience, understands that we don't have the right to retaliate. And that in retaliation, we're retaliating for our good. But patience is enduring for the another's good. Like I said, seldom found in a woman, never in a man. And then probably my, my personal favorite. I mean, obviously love, yeah, that's great. But I love this word. I love this word, kindness, kindness, benevolence in action. What a great word, kindness, to be kind, benevolence in ac action. Christates is the Greek word there, Christates, kindness. Romans 2, 4, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Paul says in Romans, sometimes we think of God's kindness and when we're kind to each other as weakness. It's not weakness. God's kindness has a, has a purpose. He's trying to draw everyone to repentance. If you have to force something, it's not actually happening. It has to be chosen, and God's trying to get all mankind 
to choose him. And he uses his kindness to do that. Or it says it this way in Ephesians chapter 2. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. The fruit of the Spirit cannot be copied or manufactured. It must be produced because it is given to us at the moment of salvation. Like, like Brother T- Sonny Tucker said a couple weeks ago, we're given the box of things we need spiritually, all things when we need, when we, excuse me, that, excuse me, <laughs> that we need at the moment of salvation. And one of the things we're given is this kindness to us in Christ Jesus because it is God's gift so that no one can boast. But I love Paul here. Paul's, he's a smart dude now. He's kind of nerdy. He's kind of nerdy like your boy. And it's pretty cool what he pulls right here. And it's, it's easy. To, you don't get it in the, in the English, but in the Greek, it's right there. So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his Christotes to us in Christos, Jesus. Notice that? Notice how close and similar those words are? That's not on accident that Paul's saying it that way. Remember, he's speaking to an oral society, right? They didn't, they didn't have the, the gift of being able to carry God's word around with them. They had to be able to memorize it. Most of the time, I mean, the letters existed, but they didn't exist on an individual level like we just take for absolute granted nowadays. So when when these letters were written and then read out loud to a congregation, it was written in a way that it would stick in your head. And, And Paul is making a direct comparison there. We should display the same this same virtue in our lives as Christ followers. We should we should show Christotes as followers of Christos. It would stick in our head, that, that oral playing of words there. It's a, cool, it's a cool thing. Strangely enough, a common name for slaves was Christos. From this same root of Christotes. All of these are virtues that you would like to have in a servant. If you were to have a servant. I think we're called to be servants. I don't think that's an accident. Moving along. I'm starting to lose some of you. I can see your eyes going glassy. Goodness. Goodness. Agathosune. Goodness. This may be, this may be thought of as, as both an uprightness of, of soul and, and as an action reaching out to others to do good when it's not deserved. This word carries both of those. It's an uprightness of soul, a goodness of soul, because of salvation in Christ, his righteousness placed upon us, and at the same time, simultaneously reaching out to do good to others. I've heard it say that that goodness is delivering something negative in the most positive way that you can. I heard that said the other day by, by one of our, one of our uh, candidates for the SBC president. We've got three that are that are candidates for the Southern Baptist president this year. And Josh and I heard one of them speak in Conway a couple of weeks ago, and, and he said that, that goodness is delivering the, the worst thing you can, because you have to, in the best way that you can. I thought, man, that's a good way to say that. Sometimes what we have to say is not, is not great, it's not nice, it's not fun, but it must be done. And goodness is doing it in the, in the best way that we can. And kindness is doing it in the kindness, kindest way that we can. Paul says it this way, 2 Thessalonians 1.11, And in view of this, we always pray for you that our God will consider you worthy of his calling and will, by his power, fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith. God desires that we live out goodness in our lives through the Spirit. Then faithfulness. These last three, these last three if you want to call it a triad, they're, they're like general principles of people that are led by the Spirit that should, they should show out in their life. Faithfulness, pistis, faithfulness, the quality which renders a person trustworthy or reliable. This is one of my, personally, one of my, one of the biggest ones to me. When, I, when, when, when getting close to someone, someone that, that, that proves themselves trustworthy or reliable, or at least admits the mistake when they weren't. You could say it's fidelity, it's faithfulness. It, it, the character of one who can be relied on. 
Do you want people like that in your life? Do you want people in your life that you can rely on? Or do you want a bunch of people that you can't rely on? It, it, it makes common sense when we put it like that. It says it like this, and in, 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 there's the Greek word, pistis, in Luke, talking about the faithful servant. Whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is unrighteous in very little is also unrighteous in much. So if you have not been faithful with the unrighteous' money, who will trust you with what is genuine? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what is your own? Faithfulness. It means when you say you're going to do something or be somewhere, you do it or you show up, regardless of how inconvenient it may have become. I'm going to read that one more time. Faithfulness means when you say you're going to do something or be somewhere, you do it or you show up regardless of how inconvenient it may have become. Inconvenience is not an excuse for us to break our word to each other. I can tell that one fell on, on ears that were happy to hear that. Gentleness, gentleness, preutes, gentleman, gentleness. This this word gentleness, it, 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 in our modern way, it's it's almost more like humility than, than than gentleness. It is gentleness. It is to be gentle, but but it but it carries the the connotation of being humble. Humi- that's a personal joke. Sorry. All right, something like humility. Here, here's the thing. We receive the word in humility, James tells us in James 1. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil, humbly, or preutes, same exact Greek word, receive the implanted word, which is able to save you. Humbly receive God's word, which is able to save you. You have to humble yourself in order to receive God's word. You have to say that you need it. You have to admit that you're not what you're supposed to be. You have to be humble to receive God's word, the same preutes, gentleness, same word. And then in 2 Timothy, Paul talking to Timothy, instructing his opponents with gentleness, perhaps God's will, God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. So we receive the word with gentleness, and then we share the word with gentleness. We, we receive the word with humility, and then we share the word with humility. In other words, we don't share the word as in, here's how you're doing everything wrong, which implies that I'm doing everything right, which you know is not true about yourself and about me. We're not doing everything right. So when we share the word, we share it in humility. We share it in a way that it wants to be received. We share it in a way that this never feels like it's happening because it can't. Who are we to point fingers at anyone? Gentleness is not weakness. It's strength and power controlled. Meekness could be another word used here, and in some translations it is. Meekness is not weakness. It's strength and power controlled. It's strength used for good of others and not for the good of the moment. Somebody tweet that. I'm telling you, that was a Holy Spirit moment. It's strength used for the good of others and not for the good of the moment. Uncontrolled strength is good for the moment. Not good in the long run. And the last one there is self-control. Self-control. In the Greek, enkratia. Self-control, enkratia. Another word you could use there is discipline. Another word that you could use there that's used in the King James is temperance. Unfortunately, temperance in the modern English has been tied only to, to uh, moderation of drinking alcohol. But we have the temperance movement, right, in the early 1900s. But it's, more, it's bigger than that. It is that, but it's bigger than that. It's temperance. It's, it's moderation in action, in thought, and feeling. It's restraint. It's, it's habitual moderation in the indulgence of the appetites or passions. Habitual moderation in the indulgence of the appetites or passions. It's usually employed to describe self-control in sexual matters. And in that, being the last thing talked about on the list, is, is definitely correlating back to the works of the flesh. I and mean, when you read the works of the flesh, there's, there's one after the other, right? We've got 
all these kind of words that we can describe things that, we're, that we shouldn't do sexually because it's destructive in our lives and in others' lives. And, it, and, and Paul finishes here with enkratia. Thayer's, Thayer's definition, the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. It's only used two other times in the New Testament, this, this, this word, enkratia, in the Greek. First, in, or also in Acts 24, 25, when Paul's in jail and he's speaking to the, to the Roman leaders, it, it, he talks about having self-control. He stays in jail after that little speech, so that went over well. And then in 2 Peter 1, 6, for two more years, by the way, 2 Peter 1, 6, when, it, when in a list like this in Galatians, in 2 Peter, Paul's, excuse me, in 2 Peter, Peter is giving a list that is similar to the fruit of the Spirit, and he uses this, this same word. It's, it's, it's last for a reason, I think. It's last because it's the final answer to the carnal list of behaviors in verses 19 through 21. The flesh being brought under the lordship of the spirit. The flesh being mastered. Lordship. We call Jesus our Lord. He wants lordship over our fleshly desires. So it's not self-control as in I'm going to grit my teeth and be disciplined. I'm going to set my alarm and I'm going to get up and I'm going to do this. It's not that. It happens because we yield to the Spirit. And the Spirit controls us. And the Spirit reminds us of God's Word. And the Spirit convicts us in those moments where it has to convict us most to keep us from doing something most destructive, which is difficult to yield to. So then I always come to, well, how? That's always the question that human beings have. That's great and all. I mean, all these nine things, you know, love and joy and peace patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's, that's great. How does this happen? It was simple. Not easy, but it's simple. The Spirit does this in our life, but what is our role? First, you've heard this, some of you that have been in church your whole life so many times, you, you click off as soon as we start explaining the gospel. We shouldn't do that. We should be reminded of how good it is. First, you have to have the Spirit in your life. You can't be controlled by the Spirit until, you're control, and, until you have the Spirit in your life. The first step is to recognize your need for a Savior, a need to be saved from your sins, repenting of your sins and confessing Jesus as King and Lord and Savior in your life. You confess that Jesus paid the price for your sins on the cross, was buried and rose again on the third day, proving his power over sin and death. That's the beginning of this journey. That is the gospel. God loves you. You have sinned against him. And he loves you in such a loving kindness, said way that he has done what it took to bring you back to him and still be just and still be righteous. Because wrong has to have a payment. But God paid it for us. That is good news. That's the first step. You can't have this other stuff in your life unless you have submitted to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Been saved, as we like to say in the Baptist church. That's a great way to say it. Save from your sins and save to eternity. Whew. If you had never done that, today's the day of salvation. I don't know why you wouldn't. I really, really don't know why you wouldn't. And then the second step, in faith, in the hope and the trust that Jesus defeated sin and death on the cross, we live out our trust in him. And here's the paradox, right? We can't produce the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit produces the fruit. But, but, but he does this in someone who is earnestly seeking to live in obedience to Jesus, all, only He can do it. Only the Spirit can produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. But He will only do it in a believer seeking faithful obedience. That's our role. Right? Uh, hear, O Israel. Shema. Right? The, it's not obey, as in just obey. Like get a list and do the things. It's hear and hear. The word is doubled up. Listen and listen. We listen and listen. We have the word implanted in us. And because of that, we seek to live the Word. And because we seek to live the Word, then the Holy Spirit does what only the Holy Spirit can do. It's not magic. It's God. So, he does all that to believers seeking faithful obedience so that we can live out 
in a way that honors God. Seek obedience. Seek to hear and hear God's word. Seek love. Seek joy. Seek peace. Seek patience. Seek kindness. Seek goodness. Seek faithfulness. Seek gentleness. Seek self-control. And in that seeking, the Spirit will produce it in your life. You won't. You can't. But in seeking it and in desiring it, the Spirit will allow it to be cultivated in your life. And in that, you will have a fulfillment that sin promises but never delivers. That's the beauty of it. When we live out life for God through others, we find what sin promises but never delivers. Just get what you want. You'll never get it. And you'll never get enough of it. But live it for others for God's name and God's sake and God's glory through the power of the Spirit because you've submitted your life to Jesus and somehow, some way, the Spirit produces this fulfillment in your life because that's what you need to be fulfilled in your life. You need, and I need, these nine things in our life. This is what we want. This is what we need. I'll finish with this. Imagine a church full of of Christians, of Jesus followers, that have ripe, ripe fruit of the Spirit in their lives. And and those seeds from the fruit that they're producing are producing more fruit and more fruit. Imagine a church that is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Imagine a church that is full of that. Wouldn't you want to come and be part of that as often and as much as you possibly could? I know I do. We just got to do it. It Tells us how here. We're going to go more into this, the following verses, the next couple of weeks. um, And uh, looking forward to it. But may our prayer be today that we seek We seek the fruit so that the Holy Spirit has a hospitable place to produce that fruit in us. 